yes it's on um so before we actually go to the session uh, good evening to one and all i take this opportunity to welcome all of you for this webinar on sustainable infrastructure for the 21st century doing more with less by dr grand right from heriot ward university so i take this opportunity to welcome each one of you as well as i like to thank uh, our uh, crescent innovation and incubations uh, council who has taken this initiative and uh, i like to thank dr kataravan uh, niti ashok and others uh, who have taken pain to organize this particular webinar and uh, my special thanks on behalf of our department and as well as our institute my special thanks to dr grand right here from heriot ward university who has taken all the pain to uh give this webinar on a very important topic sustainability sustainability is a keyword of today as we all know so whatever uh, developments we bring we have to consider sustainability in it so this uh, topic is very apt for today um, uh, sir uh, really uh, very uh, uh, thankful for coming forward to give this uh, webinar on this topic of sustainable infrastructure i am sure all the participants will be greatly benefited by this particular lecture and also uh, they will also get an idea about uh, studies in uk so before we go to the actual uh, session i uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce dr grant to all the part, uh, participants um So, Data Grand Right is presently associate professor with the School of Energy, Geoscience, Infrastructure, and Society. He has done his master's in civil engineering and a PhD in mathematical modeling of water and air system within London, underground transport systems. Right teaches on postgraduate civil engineering programs and has a wide range of industrial and research experience in the field of water management, both in UK as well as overseas. current research interest includes the development of numerical models to simulate flows at all scales from local urban drainage systems through to regional regional level flood inundation community based flood risk management within developing countries sustainable flood risk management and the social impacts of flood risk right is also ejs director of recruitment and has a in depth understanding of both research and teaching strength with this brief introduction Uh, i also like to uh, point out that we in the department of uh, civil engineering at crescent we have also faculty involving in research in these particular areas in the areas of flood management and we have also faculty specialized in gis and remote sensing who are also doing this some um, flood management studies so uh, and again i take this opportunity to welcome all the participants who have come forward to participate in this webinar i could see there are nearly 125 participants from this webinar on behalf of the department of civil engineering crescent institute of science and technology i welcome all the participants for this webinar i am sure that all of you will have a very fruitful session over to dr grant Okay, thank thank you very much for that that lovely warm welcome and uh, hello everyone wherever you're you're watching this. Um, as as you've been told, my name's Grant Wright. I am a, a civil engineer by trade, and I specialise really in, in flood management. Um, but I suppose the reason I'm here today more than anything is is my role as director of student recruitment within the school. Um, so I have an overview of what happens with both of those research. and um in terms of our teaching programs as well so the our school um is called energy geoscience infrastructure society which is quite a mouthful actually so we usually uh abbreviate that to egis and as we go through i'll give you some a flavor of the range of the many topics that we cover so here's a quick overview of my talk today um i'm not sure how familiar uh Many of you are with Harry Watt University, so I'll spend a bit of time just talking about Harry Watt University, and I'll also spend a bit of time talking about Edinburgh as well, because Edinburgh is a lovely place and it's a great place um, to be a student or or to live or do research, whatever it may be. And then I'll focus a bit more down on the sustainability aspect of how we can do more with less, because um, that really runs through runs through everything we do in the school in Egypt. 
um, both in terms of our research, and I'll cover some of the, the relevant topics in our research that, that look into the sustainable infrastructure aspects. But then I'll, I'll focus down in on some of our teaching programs, which again are highly relevant to sustainable infrastructure. And hopefully, as you'll see at some at some points in, in in the talk, we do an awful awful lot of different types of teaching programs. But I've tried to focus in on the ones that I think you guys as graduates from, from your school would be most interested in. And I suppose the reason why you're studying at the moment and perhaps why you'll come and study with us or, or somewhere else for a postgraduate qualification is, is, is all to do with employment. So I'll finish up by talking about um, employment and how we see the work that we do and also in these uncertain times, maybe where it's going to go in the future. So Heriot University, um, believe it or not, was the first mechanics institute in the world. So it's founded in 1821, which is nearly 200 years ago now, and is the eighth oldest highest, higher education institution in the UK. Hopefully, this little video will work and it'll give you a bit of a flavor of what we're all about. But we'll see. Okay, I think that's quite a nice little short introduction to the university. So that's the whole university. We don't actually cover all of those aspects, but I think at some point in the future, some of my colleagues will be coming along to speak to you about some of the work they do as well. Okay, so that's a quick overview of Harriet White. In terms of Edinburgh, um, if you've never been to Edinburgh before, where have you been? It's the most um, amazing looking place to, to work and live. It's the capital of Scotland and certainly is an exciting international and cosmopolitan city. There's lots of different surveys around the world. And to tell you the truth, we could have picked a lot of, a lot of different surveys to illustrate what a great place it is. But here's some figures for you. Second best student city in the UK and the 18th best in the world. Um, that's the QS world ranking, so not too bad. In terms of students, they make up just over 10% of the population and of those, nearly 40% uh, are international. So a really cosmopolitan place. Um, Scotland in general is less cosmopolitan, but certainly Edinburgh is, um, is, is more akin to, to London than it is to a lot of Scottish, Scottish cities. All right then, um, we have the school and the university has quite a lot of mission statements that sum up what we're trying to do. And our school, Aegis, has something similar. And it's, it makes a lot of sense. But really, I think more than anything that we could write down, I think the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals really sum up what we're all about. And to tell you the truth, they sum up what most people should be all about at the moment. So not every topic that we, that we, we are involved in touches on every single one of these goals. To tell you the truth, there's very little, there's very few of these goals that we don't actually touch on at all at some point in our, either our research interests or our teaching programs. And I'll maybe go through and see how we get involved in that type of work and we try to do a little bit more with a little bit less. Uh, Zero hunger is a really important one, obviously, for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we've, you, you, listening to the title of our school, you'd maybe think we're not, we don't really have any relevance to that, but we certainly do. This, these, these images up here are from a colleague's research who used to work predominantly in um, Scotland and was looking at how we could better schedule um, energy use to um, ensure that we, we don't overuse energy. And that was particularly relevant for areas where we use, um, for rural areas particularly, where we have uh, renewable energy. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, particularly in Scotland. 
but um, it's particularly relevant to rural areas where renewable energy is used. So he took that, he took that understanding from Scotland, and he got involved in... Um, so, someone mute their mic for me, please. It's just a bit of feedback coming back. Thanks very much. So he um, took, that, took that learning from um, work in Scotland and the UK and got involved with some research partners, both in Europe and in India, actually, and um, led to the development of approaches that could better schedule irrigation um, to improve um, crop yield. So this irrigation system that's involved in this particular project was solar powered um, and so ideal for an application for somewhere like India, um, was solar powered and the actual scheduling of the irrigation and also the energy use was uh, controlled by a smart system and led to some, some incredible um, gains actually. So here, the main picture on the screen here, we've got some, some crops. The one on the left hand side is the, the control without the, um, the improved irrigation scheduling. The one on the right hand side is the, is the output of the, the improved uh, system. So, that type of work, which comes from renewable energy research, being applied at a very local level, um, in particularly in rural areas, to help improve yield, um, which also obviously um, helps improve the livelihood of the people involved. That's one. That's one aspect of the research that's been involved. In. Uh, water infrastructure is key wherever you are. You can live without food for quite a long time, depending on, depending on your on your reserves. But without water, you're in trouble very, very quickly. Um, I get involved in flood risk management. So that's more about how we can um, deal with too much water, um, which, which tends to come down all in um, a, big, a big chunk and can inundate our areas. But a lot of our research is involved in um, water quality and, and water quantity as well. So, the gentleman in the figure here is, is one of my colleagues, um, Bhaskar Sen Gupta, who's got an OBE actually for the work he's done in terms of um, arsenic treatment, uh, trying to remove arsenic from water supplies, particularly, I mean, it has applications everywhere, but I think his work was dominantly focused in Bangladesh. Again, um, really important work, hence, hence why you see the OBE for it, but being able to use available water resources um, in, in an area where there is some contamination issues and also being able to do it in a way that is sustainable. Um, these areas do not have access to ex um, substantial resources. So again, this is a solar powered system. So a solar powered arsenic removal system means you get, uh, get rid of a lot of the contamination and has multiple benefits for individuals in terms of their health, but also for the, for the wider the wider area and the country as a whole in terms of economic development. There's obviously one of the, the real issues with um, contaminated water is the burden it eventually places on healthcare systems. So that's really important work. And, and again, in terms of the sustainability, it's, it's locally focused and can be locally managed. And that's really important. I have other colleagues involved in water resources. Uh, another colleague, Bayo Adloy, is involved with um, Many, many Indian institutions actually looking at water resources and how we can better schedule reservoir implementations to, to ensure we have the supplies when we need them. At a, more, at a more local level within the UK, myself and colleagues are involved in trying to do things um, with less impact on the environment. And the, the lower picture on this slide here shows you some, some sustainable drainage systems. Often about quantity, but more, more often about quality. So trying to treat contamination from runoff, from roads or roofs or wherever it may be, locally at source, so that we can make sure that when we discharge any discharges to, to the uh, wider environment, do not cause unnecessary pollution. So this, this, these type of activities are quite well established, but in terms of how they, how they function throughout their lifetime, their whole life performance, there's a little bit less uncertainty there. 
and a lot of our work is involved in in, in trying to work out how some of these some of these facilities function in the long term in a more sustainable way. <clears throat> We've already touched on energy infrastructure actually, but obviously alongside water and food, energy supply is one of the key key drivers for, for economic development. And again, we're involved a lot in um, looking at sustainable energy infrastructure. Some of my colleagues involved in, in, in wind farms. Um, the, the, the slide on the, the bottom, uh, the solar panels, that's actually taken from the, um, the irrigation system we talked about earlier when we were talking about food infrastructure and smart use of scheduling, irrigation scheduling, so that we ensure that we don't run out of energy. <laughs> And we also ensure that the crops are irrigated as and when they need it. But Harry was based in Edinburgh, but we have a number of number of campuses. We've got campus in Dubai, for example, one in Malaysia. We have one in the borders in Scotland, and you know near the border of England. We also have one up in Orkney. And the slide, uh, the picture on the top right here, is um, a, a tidal. Uh, energy generator which was developed up in our campus um, well the, the, the concepts were developed by a PhD student who's working in our campus in Orkney so if you've got interest in renewable energy particularly in the marine side of renewable energy um, Orkney is really the place to be there's, there's a lot of startup companies there obviously surrounded by the sea and it's, it's, it's really um, if that's your interest that's the place you want to be and there are opportunities to um, travel between the two campuses as well. And more and more, we're trying to get the campuses to work together, particularly on group project work. Um, okay. Transport's also key for any sort of function in the economy. Having a, 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 an efficient transport system is key. And making sure that's sustainable, both in terms of the vehicles that are using the, the transport system, but also in terms of Way transport systems themselves are set up is really important. The, slide, the first slide, uh, the big yellow test ring, if you like, called Graph Two, is all to do with high-speed rail. I've been to India. I, went, I was in India many, many years ago, and I travelled around on uh, uh, the, the wonderful train network you have. But one thing you couldn't you couldn't um, say about them was they're a high speed, but they're incredibly incredibly reliable and efficient and it was, it was great fun but in the UK you might be aware that we're investing in high-speed rail as has happened in other countries I was in um, China uh, in November and I was fortunate enough to go on one of the high-speed rail lines it's incredible you don't actually feel you, you, you're traveling so fast but so in the UK we're looking to develop our high-speed rail system and a lot of the technology is there I mean we don't get involved so much in the um, design of the engines or anything like that but what my colleagues are involved in is trying to work out how can we deal with some of the issues that high-speed rail brings us high-speed rail is great in terms of mobilizing vast numbers of, of people um, over relatively long distance and doing that in a relatively carbon neutral uh, uh, way but it does have some issues the impact it can have on the surrounding environment particularly you know in the areas where it goes through um, can be quite dramatic. So my colleagues are involved in trying to um, mitigate some of those 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 un unwanted um, implications, particularly in terms of ground vibrations. Trains traveling at hundreds of miles per hour do have some impact, and if they're not mitigated against, then it can cause problems. Not just discomfort, but it can also cause problems in terms of structural stability as well. So we're heavily involved in uh, UK government funded research into how we can come up with smart solutions to some of these problems. And some of some of the solutions are, uh, are remarkably straightforward. Actually, they don't involve vast amounts of additional infrastructure. They involve quite targeted um, interventions to try and um, dampen down these vibrations in the, in the ground. So again, that's a more sustainable approach, not just in the in the use of high speed rail, but also in the use of how we can we can actually mitigate against some of the problems. Other colleagues involved in um, 
structural design of bridges. And on the right hand side of this slide, you can see an element from a bridge deck um, that used to be um, on a bridge in the northwest of England. Um, and it came to the end of its, its, its supposed design life. So they, they dismantled the bridge and, and put up a new bridge. But rather than just demolish the bridge deck, um, the people involved were interested in, in understanding how the bridge deck performs now, you know, near the end of its presumed design life. So we're all quite confident, both in terms of design, design standards, and, and also in terms of the performance of materials, how some of these, these pieces of infrastructure perform when constructed. We're less confident how they perform throughout their service life. And that's really important for us to improve our confidence or our understanding in how these types of infrastructure perform throughout the service life. Because if it turns out they actually have a longer service life than we expected, then obviously that means we, don't have, we have to replace them less frequently, which is both beneficial from a financial point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. We all know the concrete can, has quite a high carbon footprint. Um, but the flip side is, if it turns out that we're a bit overconfident in, the, in, the, in our assessment of how these, these pieces of structure um, perform over their life, then perhaps we should, they're, they're, they're in use when they should be taken down sooner. Um, so it's important either way that we find out how they're performing. So my colleagues um, got some of these bridge decks shipped up from the northwest and performed some remarkable tests on them. These are big, big pieces of infrastructure, big, big bridges. It's not the whole beam now, it's a section of the beam. And then the process of trying to work out how they perform. And they've got some quite interesting techniques to do that. It's quite hard to work out what's going, in, going on inside a concrete beam when you're testing it. But if you, um, they, they, they apply some rather clever measurement techniques, which can pick up the slightest movements externally, which indicate internal stresses and strains. So that's really interesting ongoing work, not just for the UK, but for the wider world. I mean, particularly in the US, the US has, a, has a, an immense highway network and lots and lots of those bridges in that network are coming to the end of their design life. And that is a huge financial burden on the country to, to reinstate those. We're also involved in, um, Moving away slightly from the technical aspect, we're also involved in human behavior and how we can um, use human behavior studies to help improve the design of our, of our systems. And one of my colleagues is a, is a human behavior expert. So this is really about not those sort of big structural interventions. This is more about quite small, quite small scale local interventions. It might be just the way where you change the, the phrasing in, in signs, in road signs, to make people think about how to slow down. You know, putting up a road sign saying you shouldn't go quicker than 50 miles an hour has limited impact, really. Putting up a sign saying that in the past I don't know, 10 years, X number of people have, X number of fatalities occurred, does start to make people think. There's a balance there. Eh? You, you've obviously got to make sure you don't don't take people's attention away from the roads. But it's not just in terms of highway traffic, it's also in terms of rail traffic as well, and trying to prevent um, 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 accidents on the rail network. Now, I've called this one sustainable urban structure. A lot of what I've talked about is sustainable urban infrastructure. This is maybe more about the urban areas we live in. And then the main, the main slide here, the lady in the main slide is, is a colleague who's got the office next to me, she's Gabby Madero. Now she's a geotechnical engineer by trade, but for a long time she's been interested in sustainable building materials. And I think maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, she started to think about how we could make building materials more sustainable. And she started to think, also think at the time she was involved in a lot of um, geotechnical work and also a lot of work to do with uh, construction waste. So quite often, she see these big piles of construction waste being carted off site, for, uh, taken wherever to do whatever. And then at the same time, after they've been carted off site, some other 
new construction materials were brought on site to construct whatever it was that was going into place. And you start to think about where maybe where there was a conjunctive use of these two. And so she came up with this, she's got her own company now actually, it's won numerous awards, but she came up with this idea to reuse construction waste for building materials. And she's shown you here on this slide a couple of these bricks, called K bricks. I've got no idea why they're called K bricks. Maybe they're daughters of Catherine or something. But anyway, so, so these bricks not only do they reuse material that um, would otherwise have gone to less productive use, they're also they don't actually need to be fired. So when it comes to um, making bricks for construction, you obviously need to fire that in high temperature ovens, which again has a huge carbon overhead. These bricks don't need to be fired. Um, there's some secret binder, which no one knows about because it's under patent. Um, so there's some secret binder, which combines the reconstituted rubble together to make a uh, a brick that has essentially all of the all of the structural properties of a traditional fire brick, which is which is really good. There's 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 a lot more to it than that, obviously, because you've got to be careful about contamination of the materials. But this is really important work because construction is one of the biggest um, contributors to uh, our carbon footprint. So if we can cut out um, particularly that energy that's gone into that firing of those clay bricks. That's, that's an excellent use of time. Gabby's actually also involved, she still gets involved in the geotechnical side and she's from Brazil, so she's got a particular interest in what happens in Brazil and in the favelas and in, in the informal settlements in some of the large cities and the slide on the right at the top there. Um, there they have an awful lot of problems. These, these settlements tend to be built on steep sided hills, mountains, and they really are informal, so they don't have, um, they don't maybe conform to design standards. So there's a, there's a lot of issues there to do with landslides, sweeping away buildings, and unfortunately as well, people at times. Gabby's been developing approaches, really quite simple approaches actually, but again, similar to when we're talking about the transport infrastructure, simple local interventions. So placing some relatively low cost sensors at key points so that we can work out, get a bit of um, warning when something catastrophic is going to happen. Link that into some community-based um, warning system. Again, emphasizing that it's not all about technology. Quite often, uh, the important things, the only way you can, you can, you can get uh, the solutions implemented is to ensure the community is behind you. So that's another interesting aspect in terms of materials as well i've got some colleagues involved in, in in trying to reduce the uh trying to improve the performance of concrete and also trying to reduce the, the environmental impact, impact of concrete because concrete has been with us for a very very long time and has a huge impact so now onto something probably totally totally different but again it emphasizes i think the range of subjects that we cover in the, in, in the school in Aegis. Um, Sustainable Development Goal 14 is all about life below water. And we, we have a part of our teaching program and our research program is involved in biology and particularly in marine biology. So, and particularly with our links to the Orkney campus as well. So we have uh, a lot of colleagues involved in, I've called it marine infrastructure in, in um, in, in quotations, because it's not really what we call we think of as infrastructure, but it's a natural infrastructure. It's important that we try and ensure that natural infrastructure is not too uh, damaged by the by our own actions. So a lot of colleagues involved in trying to improve the way that corals are treated and, and also um, and can and can recover from when problems occur. Um, and also in terms of fisheries as well, we've got some colleagues involved in fisheries work as well. Fisheries are key for, for many parts. I mean, in, in Britain, fisheries are uh, we're surrounded by water, and, and fishing is, is a big it's a big industry here. It's the same in India as well. I think around by the coast. Um, so 
sustainable use of fisheries and fisheries policy and how we can develop that to be more sustainable is really, really important. So that's, I, I think that last slide kind of, I know it's slightly different from the previous ones, but it gives you more of a, more of an idea of the range of topics that we cover in our, in our school. So that's some of the, some of the, the research we undertake in the school in Aegis and um, that all has links into our teaching as well and, and this slide here just shows you the full range of subjects that we, we cover. So starting at the top and going round, the first sort of four are quite linked. This is postgraduate level although we, we cover most of these at undergraduate level as well. But starting at the top and going around for the first four of those little bubbles. That's really about the urban, urban infrastructure and how it's designed, uh, both at a, a, a global level, you know, how, how, how our cities are, are designed to work, but also then how the individual pieces of infrastructure are put together and constructed. So we cover that, and I, I suspect that's probably, for you guys, that's probably the most interesting, most relevant topics particularly civil engineering, construction management, surveying. So I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But just to round off the other topics we, we cover as well. So there's the, the next two around, we've got energy renewables and the marine environment and climate change. And there, the energy side, it's not just about marine renewables, but it's, it's quite heavily focused on marine renewables, but that's, that covers um, that element, and particularly with our campus up in Orkney, um, we've got a real strength in there. And then moving around for the final two, we've got geoscience and petroleum engineering. And Heritage Watt's got uh, probably one of its most famous um, programs is in petroleum engineering. It's been going for a very long time. Um, no matter what you think about uh, oil, oil's going to be around for quite a long while. And if we can um, extract it and safely and efficiently and ensure um, we deal with some of the the impacts and um, that's 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 going to be beneficial so we've got a strong a strong um, background in petroleum engineering and we we, we get um, some of the big oil companies and also some of the big countries some of the big governments in the world send us multiple students each year onto our MSC program. it's not just about oil it's about other forms of energy that, maybe he's sitting beneath beneath the earth's surface so we're heavily involved in geothermal energy as well and at the other end in co2 storage so particularly once once you've once you've um, extracted oil there's an empty reservoir there and it seems to make a bit of sense in terms of a, a cycle to maybe some of the co2 to go back into there but i suppose as i said earlier you guys are probably more interested in the civil engineering and construction management side and I think I just want to uh, focus for a little bit of time on the programs that we offer and to draw on some of that research that I talked about earlier, particularly on the sustainable side, and see if it's of any interest. So in terms of civil engineering, it's very close to my heart, I'm a civil engineer. We've got two basic programs. We've got one called Civil Engineering Construction Management, and we've got one called Advanced Structural Engineering. Um, We've got a really strong record in civil engineering, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level. We are the highest ranked, civil engineering is the highest ranked discipline in the whole university. We're in the top 150 in the world. Um, and there are an awful lot of universities offering civil engineering in the world. So being in the top 150 is, is great. I think we're in the top two in Scotland and the top 13 in the UK. Um, some of the research we talked about earlier has contributed to us being uh, ranked number one for research power in the UK, we a joint submission with University of Edinburgh. Um, and when it comes to assessing research, um, both the quality and the number of people involved, that's where you get that metric research power in ourselves and the University of Edinburgh. Our joint submission was number one. So it's good, good to know as well. So our civil engineering and construction management program is it's really it's really i mean it's it's really aimed at people who 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 have who want to retain that technical focus but also appreciate that in coming years 
the way you're going to advance within the industry is, is primarily through your management skills. So there's opportunities to take technical skills to your next level. At the undergraduate level, you'd be at a certain level and then move up to the next level. But at the same time, to introduce some management proficiency, which is really beneficial for your long-term career. As you'd expect, we're accredited by the industry. We also have an industry placement option. So on campus for one year, civil engineering construction management, um, the industry placement option, the name's slightly different, it's just called civil engineering, but it's exactly the same program. It's just with the addition of a placement year. I'll come on to the placement in, in, a, in a minute because we have a few, few programs like that. So that's civil engineering construction management. Advanced structural engineering is for those who have a real passion for structural engineering, structural and foundational engineering. Um, it's both for engineering graduates and also for practicing engineers. This is for people who want, who want to continue really focusing on, the, on, that, on that area of their, of their career. And as you'd expect, we're industry accredited as well. So that, that program has undergone quite a lot of change in recent years, and it's now been led by um, our director of studies for civil engineering, who is a very clever Greek guy who did his PhD at Imperial, so he knows what he's talking about. In terms of construction management and surveying, we have two programs. One's called commercial management and quantity surveying. One's called construction project management. Each both offer a year in industry. Um, well, you can, you can do the one year programs, but you can also opt to do the placement option. And this is delivered by our, our Centre of Excellence in Sustainable Building Design, which is funded set up by the Royal Academy of Engineering. There's only four of them in the UK, there's only one of them in, in Scotland. And I think again that goes to emphasise our sustainable criteria. Um, the construction management and surveying, uh, they give you a, a strong theoretical basis. So these both of those programs, strong theoretical basis with a really strong industry focus. So lots of industry engagement. So even if you're not, even if students are not getting involved in the placement year, if they're just being expanded one year in industry, there's annual industry days which connect students to employers. Um, there's a there's a industry advisory committee, and that's really important. All of our postgraduate programs have that industry advisory committee. Now we like to think that program we offer are relevant to the industry, and I think our employment figures show they are. The industry, industry need changes, and as that need changes, we need to know about it. So all of our disciplines have this industry advisory committee to help ensure that we um, continue to offer programs that are relevant to the industry. I talked about industry placement, and this, these are these industry placement programs. We have civil engineering, we have uh, quantity surveying, we have construction project management, those three programs we offer with a, a year's industry placement. They were designed specifically for the Indian market for that demand, so the demand for those extended MSCs in the Indian market. We only started running these last year and we've really been taken aback by the interest. Um, so a big cohort this year, last year, and hopefully a big cohort again this year. So in terms of the placement, we always look for the student to try and seek out their own placement in the first instance. I think it's better to get that fit, but there's help there. There's help if, if that's not possible. We've got a dedicated placement officer, industry contacts and career service. So trying to get the student into employment um, for up to a year. It's up to a year. Visa regulations mean it's got to be slightly in a year, but it's, it's around about a year. Um, and I think that's really beneficial. That's really beneficial, whether you want to stay in the UK or not. It's really beneficial having that years, well, essentially a years industry um, placement. Also, I always think it's quite good to do a placement. It's almost like an extended job interview as well. So you work out whether you like that company. The company works out whether they like you. I think I was, I was speaking earlier before this started to somebody, and, and I, was, I think we're talking about some of the USPs for Harriet Watt. And you know, we've gone through a, sort of covered quite a lot of areas today, and we talked about our focus on sustainability and the UN Sustainable 
development goals. But I think historically and continuing, one of our real USPs, one of the things we're really known for um, in the UK, but abroad as well, overseas as well, is, is the industry ready aspect of our students. So whether you're an undergraduate student or postgraduate student, day one we want to get you thinking about design and we also want to get you working alongside similar or related uh, professions so one of the benefits of being the way the school is is that we have civil engineers working alongside architectural engineers and construction managers and planners and that's important because when you graduate for example if you graduate with a civil engineering degree you won't just be working with civil engineers, you'll be working with all, the, all of these other wonderful people. And they've got a slightly different, different, they come from a slightly different place to yourself and they've got slightly different skill sets. So it's important you get to know how to, these people tick and get to know how to work. with them. So I've got a strong emphasis on design, but also on that complementary working. And as you'd expect, we've got lots of guest lectures for industry and every, Every year we have lots of visits from employers who are ostensibly given an overview of one of their projects, but really for them it's about recruitment. They're trying to get their name out there amongst our students. In the, um, in the depths of the recession, um, our students were still, our good students were still getting really good jobs. Now, okay, we're in strange times at the moment, but Pre-COVID, our students were, all our students were getting multiple job offers, really good job offers. Touch a bit on maybe the future deployment in, in a little bit, but it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we're also quite innovative, so we've got a strong industry focus, but we've also got this, you know, it's quite hard. Uh, no matter which way you cook it, you, have, you do have to spend quite a lot of time in lectures you know, trying to absorb some of that information that people are telling you. We try and spice it up a bit. This is, this is really interesting. This is one of my colleagues, Guy Walker. Not Skywalker, but he's Guy Walker. He's a, he's a colleague who's, who's interested in behaviour science. I touched on that earlier when we talked about transport systems. He's interested in safety as well, safety of, of big systems. And civil engineering systems are big systems. And civil engineering and construction management tend to be interested in those big pieces of infrastructure which have lots of interconnections. So he really spices up some of his work by not looking at your typical civil engineering or your construction project, but he looks at the Death Star and seeing how, how the, the, the design of the Death Star could be improved or how the Rebel Alliance could better destroy it. So we've got a lot of innovation in, our, in the way we go about teaching. Well, we've got lots of great physical facilities as well. So I don't know, on the left hand side, we've got the wave basin, um, which is an incredible piece of kit actually. Historically, we've used that to look at um, stability of offshore structures, but more and more harking back to the sustainable energy aspect. It's about how we can better harness um, the power of waves and tides for energy. On the right hand side, we've got some interesting interesting um, structural experiments which neatly neatly um, combine both the uh, the physical lab so we're testing the beam there but also again I, I touched on this earlier we were talking about the transport bridge the innovative uh, measurement systems so that we can try and illustrate what's happening inside the beam it's really interesting. so we've got some great lab facilities and we've also got some great digital, physical lab facilities, but also digital lab facilities. Um, colleagues involved in transport design, which have a lot to do with behaviour, um, construction management, and something that's close to my heart. And typically, it's the one animation that decided not to work. <laughs> the one in the top right is about flood risk management. So we've got some great lab facilities. Uh, as you'd expect, um, particularly where we are. If you know Edinburgh, if you don't know where Harriet was, go, after this talk, go away and look at it on a map. And then if you look slightly north of there, you'll see this bridge scape on the right hand side here, which shows you um, from the right to the left, 
You've got the, the rail bridge, which was built many years ago, and will still be standing for many, many more years. In the middle, you've got the uh, original road bridge, which was built not that long ago, but has suffered some issues. And on the left-hand side, you've got um, the new Queen's Ferry crossing, which has only been opened a few years, and it basically takes a lot of the load from the original road bridge. I mean, that's a really interesting, it must be the most impressive bridge scape, if such a word exists, in the world. But I think what's really interesting is seeing how design has evolved uh, throughout the years. The rail bridge is very chunky and probably a bit over-designed. Left-hand side, you've got the new crossing, which is very elegant, will hopefully be up for many years. And in the middle, you've got um, something that is not that old, but hasn't really performed as well as it should have done. And it just goes to show you that you have to, um, these big pieces of infrastructure, a lot can go, a lot can go wrong. That's why you need to have a lot of, a lot of different skill sets. Um, in terms of, I'm going to finish up in a minute because I know there's a few people got some questions. But in terms of our attitude to teaching, um, a lot of formative. Uh, uh, assessment so trying to give you a bit of feedback and then up with some summative assessment uh, we try and use a mix wherever possible particularly you know with with some of the issues to do with covid that are coming up um, trying to double down on using that blended approach so exams individual projects particularly group projects group projects are really really important um, not just because you can achieve more because you definitely can obviously if there's more of you working on it but also you can work with different people as well. And if you do an MSc at first, there's obviously dissertation is a big aspect. Um, from an entry grade point of view, these are our these are the sort of things we're looking for. Overall score of about 55 for most Indian universities. Um, but if you've not got that, you know. It's, it's not a definite no, it's just we have to look elsewhere for, for evidence that you do, do well with us. That's what's important. We want you to do well with us. English, uh, we don't tend to have a problem with the English of Indian students. They tend to have very good English. But there's, there's obviously some qualifications you have to um, step up to. I'm going to finish soon because I know I've been going on for a bit, actually. But I just want to quickly go over the, the MSc structure. This is your typical MSc structure with us. It's typical of everywhere, I suppose. So three semesters, four talk courses, four talk courses, and third semester dissertation. If you're interested in the placement year, similar to your two talk courses, then you go out for a placement for just, just shy of a year. Uh, that's really for visa requirements. And then you come back and you do, do your dissertation. Ideally, you do your dissertation based on some interest that you've developed during the placement. Uh, breaking news. Okay, so <laughs> our, typically our programs here, as you can see, start in September. And depending on whether you're doing the placement, it can either end uh, following all, uh, following all this or the year after that. Um, and we still think that's the best way for students to to study with us. But you know, the world's a bit of a funny place at the moment, and for various reasons, some students won't be able to start an MSc program in September this year. So we've just worked, decided that we're gonna start all our Aegis programs, both in September and in January as well. So ideally, I think if you're considering coming to study with us, the best time would come in September. There are, have some mitigation measures to ensure that, that that's okay. But there are options to start in January. Okay, finishing up soon. So in terms of employment, there's some figures we could, we could uh, picked various different surveys to look at our employment figures, but 95%, this is graduates across the piece, but number one in Scotland, I think that's really important, number one in Scotland in terms of graduate salaries. And that's the way it's traditionally been. As I said though, we're in a strange, strange new world. COVID's affected all of us, all of us and, and every aspect of our economy. And so it's, it's hard to know what's gonna happen. In the UK, and in most, most parts of the world, central governments have decided to they have to prop up the economy through injecting capital into the economy. 
And I think in the UK, that's not going to change when things start to pick up. And if anything, it's going to increase. So this is this was taken from the other day. Uh, Boris Johnson plots for infrastructure spending. So that infrastructure spending is good news for people involved in the construction industry. It's not just going to be the UK uh, that's going to be doing this. Um, I suppose it's famously it happened um, in the US many years ago, you know, coming out of the Depression. They almost built their way out of the Depression. And I think for the construction, there's a lot of uncertainty involved in the world in general, and that includes the construction industry. But I think the only way out of this is to, well, probably one of the best ways out of it is to ensure that um, we use um, what we have to improve our infrastructure, so a stronger coming out of this crisis. Okay, I'm sorry, I went, I went off a bit longer than I thought. Thanks, thanks very much for listening. And, and yeah, th uh, thank you, Grant. And uh, oh, because of time limitations, uh, let's have one question. And remaining questions, I will just take it from the email. So, from a cost standpoint, right, the cost of uh, construction in India is around two thousand rupees per square foot quality construction, which is around twenty pounds. So, how do you see cost and sustainable infrastructure? What is the relationship between? Can we achieve sustainable infrastructure by controlling uh, cost or a minimal cost? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, I think some of the work I touched on earlier, particularly the the um, the, uh, the the reuse of the reuse of um, demolition.